A very warm welcome back to our Musically Speaking series in which I've been chatting with some of classical music's leading musicians from their homes. I hope you're all very well, lovely to see you. Uh, I'm Alexander Shelley, I'm Music Director of Canada's National Arts Centre Orchestra. Um, that orchestra is based uh, in the nation's capital of Ottawa um, and is resident, as you might have guessed from the name, at the National uh, Arts Centre, which is situated just across from Parliament. Um, and as with so many arts organisations around the world, our season has been postponed for the time being. Uh, but normally in the various auditoriums in our building, you can enjoy English theatre and French theatre, Indigenous theatre, the world's first, um, dance and pop music uh, and variety alongside the many concerts that we as an orchestra uh, present there in our home of Southern Hall. I'm not actually speaking to you from Ottawa, but I'm speaking to you from my hometown of London, England, where I've been with my family since the beginning of the recent uh, crisis. And as with so many of you who are tuning in, and as with so many people around the world who are still in a form of lockdown, uh, we're really missing the joy of face-to-face -face interaction, particularly in our case, the joy of making music together for uh, and with an audience. Uh, so I'm most grateful to you that you've joined me live today as we all try to create whatever bond we can in the virtual world. This series, Musically Speaking, is a bi-weekly hour-long live session which I welcome uh, stars of the classical world to play for us and to talk to me and to talk to you, uh, to tell them about ourselves and to field not just my questions but your questions. Uh, over recent weeks, we've spoken to James Ennis, Gabriela Montero, Misha Brugger gossman and have received uh, many really great questions from the live audience. So whether you're watching via the NAC's Canada Performs platform or via my Facebook page uh, or via the NAC Orchestra's page, please don't be shy. Share any questions that you have. Um, and my brilliant assistant, Kelly Simmons, who appears as Alexander Shelley in the chat box, and who is fielding everything and producing brilliantly behind the scenes, she'll feed them uh, to me. And I'll try and include as many as I can, but apologies in advance if I don't get to them all. Um, and before we introduce our amazing guest, uh, just one final thought. Alongside all the heartache that so many people are going through as a result of COVID-19, there's a very, been a very different kind of heartache and anger expressed around the world over the last week uh, in response to the murder of George Floyd. And in the face of social injustice and violence and the quest for equity, most things, including what I hope will be this very interesting conversation about music today, pale into relatively relative uh, insignificance. I think we're all aware of that. So before we begin, I'd like to firmly reiterate what was uh, put up on the NAC uh, uh, social media channels on Tuesday, which is that we add our voice strongly to those who stand in solidarity with the black community and to other communities of color who face discrimination and racism. Uh, and on that note, uh, let's move on to our uh, wonderful guest for today. I'm so thrilled to welcome him. He's only 25 years old, and yet he's already built a remarkable international career. He's a Juno Award winner. He's an Echo Prize winner. He's a recipient of the Leonard Bernstein Award. He's a UNICEF ambassador to Canada. He has had an exclusive recording contract with Deutsche Grammophon since he was 15 years old. Um, as a recitalist, he's a regular guest on the, the greatest stages of the world. He performs as a soloist alongside the finest orchestras. He's a close friend of the NAC orchestras. He most recently appeared as a soloist on our European tour in 2019, as well as our 2017 tour of Canada, all the provinces and territories. He's a brilliant and a wonderful guy and a dear friend, and I'm so glad that he's found time to be with us. Please join me in welcoming Jan Lyshetsky. If he's there somewhere. Jan, are you there? I'm, Hi. I'm unable to start my video because- I'm Oh, but we can hear you. Welcome, Jan. Do you think, are we gonna see you? I'm trying to put my camera on. Here we go. Kelly, could you unblock my camera because it says I can't add it because you've stopped me. Uh -huh. oh, there we are. Welcome. <laughs> it's so nice to see you. How are you managing? Very well, thank you. Yeah, and your family as well, I hope. Yes, we're all well. We're here at home in Calgary. This is my, uh, this is our living room actually, just taking up with my camera. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> it's inside. Yeah, so, it, looks, it uh, looks Beautiful. Calgary is where you were born, right? It's been your hometown your whole life. Yeah. The house I've lived in all my life, actually. So. Oh. And so, as with the rest of the music industry, I assume your season has been put on hold. How have things looked for you since this all began? Well, believe it or not, my last concerts were in February uh, with the La Scala Orchestra. So we rehearsed in Milan and a performance in Rome. So the 
just as everything was spiraling out of control in Italy, I was there and performing still. So uh, quite a surreal experience to think back to that. And since then, I've had about 50 concerts canceled so far. Uh, so it's it's dramatic, of course, for all of us. But but I just hope for a return to normal when it's safe to do so. Yeah, and amazingly, I believe you're you're actually going to be performing for a live audience in 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 a, in a week or so. Yes, exactly. I'm leaving actually on Saturday to Germany, and I'm playing four concerts over the course of two days for socially distanced audience and smaller groups. And I'm I'm really uh, looking forward to seeing how it works. It's I, I'm treating a little bit of a like a little bit of an experiment because I don't know. I mean, it's such a different world. I mean, first of all, how will I feel coming back to performing? How will how will it feel? Playing with an audience that's sitting, how many, however many meters apart from each other, and the entrance and the exit, and the lack of interaction with them, but very bizarre. No. Uh, I'm glad that my heart is coming back in any case. It's a brave new world. So, um, before we get into, I want to talk about lots of different things to do with your life and your inspiration and everything else. Uh, we're going to do a quick fire session of questions because I think it's fun for, for there'll be many people watching who know you very well, but for those who don't, and maybe for those who do, uh, let's, let's see what your quick responses are. So, there are one word answers to begin with. Mornings or evenings? Mornings. Town or country? Uh, country. Winter or summer? Winter. Practicing or performing? Performing. Fiction or nonfiction? And nonfiction, good nonfiction. Yeah, me too. Mac or PC? Listen or talk? Listen. Eat in or take out? Eat yeah. in. Physiotherapy or psychotherapy? Neither. Oh, cool. Drive or walk? Walk if I can. Walk or fly? Well, then I think fly. <laughs> okay. Emotion or reason? Uh, both. Okay. And if you had to choose? Mm, reason over emotion. Okay. Federal or Nadal? When, oh, uh, not really into tennis, so I'm not going to comment. Okay, that's a, fair enough. Uh, maybe the next one then, Mozart or Beethoven? Ooh, I'll offend lots of people if I answer that. Both? No, okay. Both? Okay. <laughs> Analog or digital? You can't have both. Which is it? <laughs> Analog, okay. Um, so non-one word answers. If you could describe yourself in three words, what would they be? Uh, whoa, you really put me on the spot now. You don't have to answer. I'm just, if something comes to the top of mind. No, oh, it's nice. Um, active, always happy, and uh, looking forward to the next adventure. No, it's not three words, but it's too crazy. Yeah, I love it. Uh, if you weren't a musician, what would your dream job be? Uh, when I was a kid, I thought I would be a pilot or a lawyer or, I don't know, a doctor, but Somehow music took up all the space in my life, and I haven't had time to think what I would do if it wasn't there. Okay, okay, that's a good answer too. Uh, what job would you be least good at, do you think? Uh, something, something that, that would be mundane, I think. That, that would probably be my worst uh, nightmare. <laughs> okay, but it depends, I suppose, what counts as mundane. Some people think of mundane, what you might think of, or me think of as mundane as something very, you know, I, I like okay. the adventure. I like, I like the unusualness of, of what, what happens of every day being different. Okay, I love it. If you could meet anyone in history and talk to them, who would it be? I've always wondered about that because sometimes I, I've thought, you know, could I ask, if I could ask Chopin a question about something and then I get the answer. But then I thought about that and I thought maybe it's better not to know the answer. So I, I don't really, like, in a sense, I, I like to live with the, the, the dream of somebody, the idea yeah. of somebody. Actually, someone's getting to know them. I've debated about that before. Who was it? Who, someone said, probably many people have said fulfillment can be the end of desire, and it's the same kind of, uh, same kind of idea. Um, okay, four more questions. The last three are connected. This one, though, isn't. Do you have a greatest fear consciously? Anything that worries you? No, uh, though, sometimes being on stage, you fear some things. That something <laughs> might go wrong, a little bit unexpected, but, but you sort of channel that, I think. I, I don't yeah. really. Person. Okay. Okay. And these are the last three. They all belong together. You go to a desert island. What book, what movie, and what piece of music would you take? Ooh. Um, 
movie, I'd probably take Emily because it would make me cry and laugh at the same time. Book? I, I don't know. I mean, in music and book, I can't really take one. That's the hardest thing ever. Um, music, I might take something that I could study. I mean, it's very cliche, but something like Bach that you could really process. Maybe I finally understand why he wrote what he did. Uh, as far as to enjoy, maybe I would take something else. But then again, I don't know how long I could listen to Rachmaninoff or something depressing when I'm stuck on a desert island. Yeah. Um, book, I mean, there are many books that I'd love to reread once in a while, uh, just because they really wake up my imagination. Uh, 1984, for example, but again, on a desert island, would I want to reread that? I don't think so. So, <laughs> I don't know. that's a perfectly reasonable answer, I find. Um, so, listen, that I believe me, the rest of the, the conversation is not going to be as weird as that. I, I really am grateful that you gave us those off the top of your head responses. Um, but today is, is not just about us talking and our audience, you know, hearing you speak about your life, it's also about hearing you play your amazing instrument. Thank you in the middle of lockdown for agreeing to, to play some stuff for us live. Um, you've got three works that you brought along. Tell us what's up first and, you know, why you've decided to play it for us today. Well, first I wanted to play some uh, Chopin, Chopin Nocturne, Opus 9 number 1. And this Nocturne I've lived with for a very, very long time. I think it was the first one I learned and it's it's been a part of me and my playing. And I know that being at home, I mean, I used to have an upright piano, two upright pianos in the corner over there, and then there was a grand, and there's a different grand, and then finally this one, which, by the way, is very out of tune, so I apologize in advance. So it's not going to be great. Um, so it, it sort of lived with me, and I've traveled with it, and, and I, I breathed it and thought about it. So it's something very personal and uh, very emotional. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, enjoy, everyone. Uh, Chopin, Opus 9, number one. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jan, that was so beautiful. So how long has that instrument been with you now? Uh, it's been with me for five, six years, I think. Five, six years. You, you said you've had a sort of progression of instruments and it's, it's I mean, it, I've, of course, because you play it when you're home every day, it feels like you're so comfortable with, with what it's doing for you in that room. Is it very close to your heart? It is very close to my heart. And, and I've been very, very privileged and lucky because uh, I have been given three pianos as gifts over the course of my life. Um, um, my parents bought me my first upright and then my first grand, and then I was given a Steinway B by a wonderful man who was in uh, Ontario and who transported it here, and it was really, really uh, special. And then this one, which is a Steinway D from New York, was offered to me in exchange for those other two uh, by the local piano dealer here and it, it was it's a very nice piano as a CD so it's a concert designation piano that was here for a competition and it stayed it stayed at my house and, and it was it was still at the beginning of March right before I came home knowing that I would be here for a while but obviously I don't want to create the necessary <laughs> so I don't want to bring the tuner in yet while I'm home uh, and get the exposure so it, but it sounded it, it sounded magical and you know, it's interesting that you chose Chopin as the, the first composer to play for us today, because of course, well, at least for me, and I think for many of your, your fans, he's a composer that we all connect with you very much, not just because of the shared Polish descent or because in my case, we perform the music together, but, but also because he was kind of a key personality in, at least as I perceive it, and maybe you see it differently, the, the sort of breakthrough moment in, in, in your career. Um, do you think, you were drawn to him early or you had success with him early because of that shared Polish descent or was it something completely different? It's a, easy to, to bring the, those links, you know, with nationality and, and culture. And of course, I'm sure there is some impact, some effects based on the fact that, that I, I speak the language, that I know the culture, I know the food, that I have grandparents, that I've been in Poland countless times. But I think I love Chopin's music as a pianist, simply. Uh, mm. I, you will be hard pressed to find pianists who really just dis dislike Chopin's music. And of course, there are uh, different ways of approaching his music and different ways of playing. And, and that's the beauty of it, that the joy is that, that you can do so many different things with this wonderful music. And I think it uses really our instrument, uh, I don't want to say to its full potential, but, but the way I imagine the piano <laughs> to be to sing, to, to give long phrases, um, and things that simply usually don't don't happen uh, so much with other people. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I remember going back to the first time we met. It was actually at my my house in London, or rather my parents' house in London. And uh, you and my dad used to know each other well and work together. And uh, I think at the time you were preparing M Mozart's double concerto, which is why you were in London. You were rehearsing together. Uh, and I remember meeting you what I think was the first time. And uh, you were still a young man. And what really stuck with me was uh, firstly how charming you were and how fun you were, um, but also how engaged uh, your mind was in, in everything, right? It wasn't just music. It was if there was a computer game or anything else or any point of conversation, you were fully there and engaged. Um, and I've noticed that definitely not in all musicians, but in many performers, you notice uh, an interest in the intellect and the engagement, which often makes me wonder whether whether they put their mind to anything they would have succeeded. And do you have that sense about yourself that music is the, the channel you went or the course you went, but actually you could have applied yourself anywhere? I think I was fortunate that, that 
this path was in front of me and I had an incredible adventure, certainly. And then I think we could say that, that uh, well, they say 10,000 hours or they say uh, full application, but there is something to be said about that, that sort of dedication, that when you put yourself really towards something that you give everything, absolutely 100%, mm. then you, you have a bigger chance of success. And I think with music, at least with my experience with music, because I started playing concerts so early, it did take up that big part of my life, uh, which naturally then made it important in it. Um, yeah. It, it organically created this, this fear. Mm. But uh, it is only one part of my life. And, and when people uh, question or say, well, what are, you, what are you doing right now in this quarantine? And are you, you know, you must be going in your mind. And I say, actually, no, I'm really busy. I have so many things to do. Working in the garden, and I'm learning German, I'm uh, figuring out some other things in my life that I needed to sort out, and just all, all sorts of things on the go. I'm happy to, to be doing what I am. And most certainly, I love music and I miss my audiences without a doubt, and I miss the life, but mm. it's not, not the, there's not a constant pain that, oh, every day I wake up in the morning and I think, oh my God, why am I not playing concerts? It's what mm. I know was there, and I know. Well, and I think that um, music is such an interesting field because many, many people who, who build careers in the industry start when they're very young. It's, it's a bit like sports or a lot of other things to kind of get that head start. You have to have been good at a young age. Um, but I think for, for, for all of us, there's this, this question of if I spend time on other things, will it in fact really enrich my music making? And it's such, I, I find such an interesting question because you see, in, for example, with you, people who are 13, 12, and they have gifts that you could spend a lifetime trying to achieve by broadening your mind and experiencing things. And you see others who have a lifetime of experience who, who don't have that expressive um, ability on an instrument. At the same time, do you find that in those few moments that you've had in the last, let's say, decade since your career began, have you found they've enriched your, your work on stage? Well, certainly. I mean, every, I think that you, what you just touched on, every a facet of life, every aspect has some impact on how I perform, on how mm. I interpret things, on how I approach music. And I think you need to bring inspiration to the stage. You need to bring inspiration to your instrument. And personally, I don't think that can come from just sitting and practicing in the studio. That, mm -hmm. that is really my, my sort of sphere of world of thinking. And, and playing every time on stage, you also learn something. You learn about yourself, how to get past your own inhibitions, your own blocks, your own fears. Mm -hmm. uh, you learn how to communicate with an audience and you think then you know, think you know it all as, as you probably know and then you go out one day and it all goes wrong and you have no idea why it wasn't like all goes wrong in the sense that you didn't feel a connection, the audience was just not there with you, whatever, and, and you, then you come to rethink it again and think, what did they do, what happened, why, why did it happen that way? And mm -hmm. it's good to have something else in that, that doesn't yeah, yeah. Mess you entirely. <laughs> Right. You mentioned the 10,000 hours, the, the Malcolm Gladwell, because that's a very interesting point, too. I mean, firstly, there's most definitely this terrifying sense that the more you know, the, the more you realize what you don't know, because you have access, access to more things. Um, but also, I find for, for any young people, uh, you are a young person, but young, even younger people watching who are thinking of, of going into the industry, that 10,000 hours question can be... Uh, elusive and seductive because in fact it's the way you use those 10,000 hours of course it's it's the type of practice that you do and the way that you use your mind in it um but I want to in a sense go back to those uh, uh, even earlier years with you because I read this this book recently called Blueprint which is it's very interesting by Robert Robert Plowman who's a, a psychologist and behavioral geneticist and it's basically about the question of nature versus nurture now if I remember correctly among your sort of close relationships there aren't excuse me close relations there aren't necessarily many, if any, musicians. Is that right? And, and even though you're, right. And even though your parents, I mean, I, if I, I couldn't think of two more committed and kind and engaged parents in the world. So you've had that kind of nurture, um, but neither in the, in the musical nurture nor in the DNA, is there any obvious reason why at the age of 13, you should have been already breaking through into the world circuit? What explanations do you have for your experience as a little boy, how you came to the piano? Well, I came to the piano, I think, first of all, it's really important uh, for children to give them these experiences, whatever experiences, maybe skiing, music, swimming, anything that, that you might sort of remember later in life that, that you've at least attempted, very, very important. And when you, when you do that, when you actually get involved in something, 
they, I think you will choose a path. And music to me, I mean, I loved skiing, absolutely, I adored it. I loved swimming, I was very good at that too, but I, music was something that, that had so many unknowns. Like it wasn't, you know, skiing or swimming was the fastest, the best technique. That's it, you just go and you do it and you're the best or you're not. The music, it was, you know, I was always questioning, I was going to lessons, I was probably the most annoying student because I would always ask, you know, why am I supposed to do it this way? Well, why, why is my way wrong? Well, it doesn't say in the score that, that you have to play it this way, but this is a tradition. I said, but why is it the tradition? Who, who put that tradition in there? You know, so on. And so this sort of uncertainty uh, and no right or wrong way is really helpful in keeping me engaged in music because I know, I mean, that you could absolutely drive yourself insane with that sort of thinking, you know, this isn't right, is there another way, maybe I should do it another way, maybe that, that's the, well, well why am I, but, but if you really just allow yourself to, to believe in what you're doing and allow yourself to go sometimes with your heart, sometimes with the reason, then you figure out your own way of playing, and I think that's an amazing thing. Do you start learning pieces at the instrument, or do you start away from the instrument? I like starting to learn at the instrument because to me the biggest obstacle, it's not such an obstacle, but the biggest obstacle is to actually play the notes. I mean, as a pianist, that's, that's a big thing. You have to sometimes really decipher what goes where and figure that out. And once that's done, when I have that groundwork, then already by that point, actually, to be honest, I have a musical idea, but then I can really start rethinking things musically. Mm. Uh, but of course, you can. I can study a score, I can imagine what it will sound like, but then I'll be more frustrated because I'll go sit in front of the piano and I'll still have to learn all those bloody notes. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I, I ask only because I, I, for me, the, the, the relationship to how I read music changed dramatically when I, I moved away from playing it on the cello first, which was my main instrument, and, uh, and into spending all of my time studying scores because I would just do it at a table, very rarely at a piano. Um, and it, it just changes the process. You know, all musicians can do it kind of either way. But if, if most of your time is spent at, a, at a, a desk, you begin your relationship with the score in a different way. So when you talk about that question of reason versus emotion, I found that as a cellist, uh, one of the benefits was immediately having a physical relationship to it, but also one of the disadvantages because immediately things were formed by my physiology and my, my physical relationship to the instrument. But you don't have those kinds of problems because you can get around the instrument without well, any issue. Think about that. That's one of the, the things that bothers me sometimes when I listen to, to piano interpretations, to music in general. When I hear the music being shaped by the technical limitations, by, by what is um, by, by safety, by playing something safely so that you will be accurate or that you won't, won't slip up. I'm the one who will take those risks, who will go you know, a, a step further, maybe a step too far, some would say, but, but if, I, if there's a phrase and I want the phrase to go on, even if there's a big jump somewhere, then I don't want to limit myself because the piano has a sort of you know, natural flow or I have to make a technical leap or something. That's yeah. totally out of my element to, to do that. Yeah, good for you. It's quite right. So, uh, in in that vein, let's hear you play some more piano, if you don't mind. You brought a, a second work by a composer. You're going to play two pieces by him, uh, Felix Mendelssohn, also a man who was prodigious in talent. Uh, talk to us about what you're what you're going to play for us now. I'll play a Mendelssohn's Rondo Capriccioso. I, I love Mendelssohn's Rondo Capriccioso because it's it's a well, it's first of all, it's a joyous piece, and second of all, it. You know, Mendelssohn always struggled with this, am, am I a serious composer or am I not a serious composer? And I think he was absolutely a serious composer. <laughs> but, but people always dismissed him, you know, as this lighthearted, frivolous, because he was joyous. And I think that sort of reflects my character, because I am a very joyous, happy person. I wake up every day happy. And I yeah. sort of have an air about me, that, that way of life. But I can certainly be serious, I hope. And <laughs> it doesn't limit what I can do. And I, so I sort of associate with my book. Okay, beautiful. So this is the Rondo Capriccioso. Thank you, Yeah.
yeah it just sounds beautiful even through you know zoom you sound <laughs> spectacular thank you so much yeah um word past the music whenever <laughs> yeah exactly um you know thinking about what you were you were talking about about learning music of the instruments and uh, and the different approaches one has uh i want to talk about something that's relatively recent i think um unless i'm mistaken in your career which is directing from the keyboard your relationship with academy of samantha of the fields and i think chamber orchestra of europe as well um talk to us about that was that a, a natural evolution or did you get invited out of the blue what happened well it's funny it was in a sense a natural evolution and, and from an early age i had a, a connection with orchestra members i think i, I loved um, chamber music and I like the chamber music approach of playing even when I'm playing with the large ensemble mm. and without a doubt it it's wonderful and it's absolutely a joy to make music with conductors like you that, that bring uh, bring great greatness <laughs> to, to to the score like give me inspiration that adds something to it but it can be also a little bit of a drag when you're working with somebody who doesn't treat necessarily what I'm doing seriously when they have their big symphony in the second half and the right. guys are left behind for you know okay let's just run it through and it'll be fine the solos will shine and so then I've, I've had my fair share of experiences like that and then I rely upon bringing the music to the orchestra members directly they often want to play I want to inspire them then to, to play with me and so it was a natural evolution. I had some funny instances where I had to play with a conductor because something went wrong. Uh, for example, I was on tour with uh, Yannick Nerezege in Japan and we were playing many concerts. It was wonderful. We had a great experience. Beethoven's fourth piano concerto. The last one was the biggest, the most important, which was in Santori Hall. And he fell ill to, to the point that he went to the hospital and they wanted to cancel the concert. But they, he said that he might be able to come back, but he needs to come back to the hospital. And he was still there and it was too late. And, I said, well, I can play the Beethoven without a conductor, that's fine. And they looked at me like, Roger and Phil, are you sure you want to do that? I said, yeah, sure. I mean, we've played it before, it'll be fine. Right. It yeah. was, it was really like, it, it, of course we lacked some of the refinement and some of the clarity and some of the um, elasticity, so to speak, but it was also uh, very fluid and, and- You can say it, yeah, and it's what every conductor loves to hear is that it was much more fun without the conductor. You can say it, it's okay. <laughs> It's not true, and and that's the thing. So, but but to work with some in certain pieces and with certain ensembles, I mean, uh, taking a conductor from the Chamber Orchestra of Europe, unless it's really top tier conductor, is is really a waste because each mm -hmm. musician there can can do their own thing. And I think when they rely too much on uh, the the person who stands between myself and them, as much as sometimes sometimes it can bring greatness, and sometimes it just it really detracts from the experience. Right? Well, and the but thing is that with there are exceptions where you need to really coordinate as a conductor but i think as a general rule the more that you bring everybody on stage to be able to hear each other listen to each other and play with each other using that instinct the better you are that that has to be the goal of a conductor and as a as, a, as an accompanist you need to do everything you can do to get out of the way and help in the moments where you can be helpful but but I, from that point of view it seems like the starting point soloists and musicians of the orchestra just connecting and the conductor kind of saying, right, let me get out of the way and get in when I can. Um, but so I, I understand it absolutely. Do you think that that's going to be um, a bigger part of your life moving forward? Would you like it to be? Well, in this in this sort of uh, way and shape, uh, absolutely. And I've enjoyed it very much. I yeah. realize the limitations. I realize the, the sacrifices one sometimes makes uh, because it's impossible to, to put everything with precision and uh, I'm, I'm not pretending that I'm a conductor by any means, by any stretch of imagination, but when I'm working, when I treat the score like chamber music, then it's fine, then, then it really works. It's a perhaps slightly different uh, performance and uh, experience than it would have been with the conductor, but that's fine for me as well. I, I appreciate that and I understand that. Good. So I've got, our, our audience has been very, very patient. They've asked a bunch of questions. I'm going to whiz through them because it would be lovely to give them uh, responses. So um, a dear friend of the orchestra in the NAC is Anita from, from Ottawa, asks quite a straightforward question. She says, they're beautiful flowers behind you. Are they from your garden? And what are they? They're lilies of the valley and they, are, they smell fantastic, absolutely. And my mom picks them and then they walk around the house. When I'm practicing during the day, they're near me and I have this wonderful... Oh, um, they're beautiful. 
They're beautiful. Um, from Montreal, Quebec, uh, Johan Nigoyen says, hello, I reckon I mentioned to you in the past that you were looking forward to playing more Rachmaninoff pieces in the future. Could you share with us your plans to expand your repertoire, please? What composers might be kind of up your sleeve, he's asking. Well, uh, during this quarantine situation, or at home, I've been learning Max Goldberg creations, for example, not because I have them planned for any concert, but because I want to dedicate some time to them. I've been learning uh, Shostakovich, first piano concerto, Bach, first piano concerto, keyboard concerto, um, different Chopin nocturnes. It, it just depends what, what comes along at that given moment. And I have a great list of things I'd like to learn and not enough time, even, even now. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I apologize. I think it might be Johanna. It, it's a, probably a lady. Excuse me. Uh, I, I'm reading it off here and I could have been a German man or a, but anyway, it's a lovely question. Um, Francisca Aguirre Molteiro from Chile asks, um, if you also play chamber music, I know the answer to this, do you like accompanying pianists and singers, for example? Um, uh, so that's probably apt for considering what was canceled for you recently. I know I've, I've had a wonderful experience recording with the baritone Matthias Gurna in July of last year. The recording was released this March. Uh, it's Beethoven leader, obviously for the Beethoven year. And I had an absolutely fantastic time working with him, learning these pieces, and, and actually first time for me working with a singer yeah. uh, to, in, in the full capacity of that sort of uh, role. And it was, I don't think I could have had a better first experience. Yeah. He is very, um, he's a great musician. He listens actively to the pianist, and I think it was a good collaboration. But of course, because of the situation, we've had uh, almost all our concerts canceled. Together, mm -hmm. uh, Vienna and Toronto and oh. New York and who knows? I mean, basically, the big halls we were supposed to play in all canceled. We yeah. do cross our fingers because the Osberg Festival wants to proceed and we have a date there. Uh, so, in August, I'm hoping we get the chance at least Good. to do it. Good, fingers good. crossed. Yeah. Um, I have a, 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 a few little things that, that uh, I wonder. So, we talked about. You, you felt that uh, starting at the age you did was, you know, everything's kind of worked out exactly right. You feel like you have a good balance life, but do you think, do you think there's anything you felt like you missed out on be because you've spent basically the age of 15 to 25 fully in the, in the midst of a big career? Are there things that you look forward to catching up on, let's say? Absolutely. There's always things that you miss out on without a doubt. And, and uh, you can't have the cake and eat it too, as they say, you know, you, you, yeah, yeah. In life. And, and I have, and I've done what I feel is most important to me at the moment, and yeah. I've enjoyed doing that. And the, the thing is that I'm not sure how much of what I've missed out on I could attribute specifically to the piano versus just me being myself. Uh, right. Missed out on, you know, parties after school or, yeah. who knows, I mean, that, that sort of thing, hanging out with friends, going camping every weekend, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, I missed out, but, but I had an incredible life so far. I mean, I, I've always felt very privileged with what I have, yeah. and I, we've also lived in a very privileged time, and I continuously took advantage of that. I felt that the ability to travel so freely and so easily around the world mm -hmm. was a gift that mm -hmm. previous generations didn't really have. And I mean, to date, I've seen about 100 countries, which is quite good, mm -hmm. and I'm very satisfied that I did so far, mm -hmm. and I've enjoyed a lot of with that. So, I've had a very privileged and different life than I would have had I not played the piano. So it's it's hard to you know you can't really say one of them. Did you did you have time to 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 have idols or mentors when you were growing up, or did it just you know was that not a thing that happened for you? But but I have to I mean I always question anything that somebody tells me, even if it's a great conductor or musician, yeah. and they tell me something and I. I'm, my first instinct is to question it, <laughs> to, not to accept it. Like that's, that's just my personality. I will always, I question not in the negative way of, you know, why did they say it, but, but trying to understand it for myself, really appreciate that, what, what it was. Um, and I have to be really thankful to my teachers here in Calgary that I had, that they guided me on that path, that they didn't take away the love of music, that they didn't really formulate me into what they imagined to be a pianist. Do you think it was serendipity your parents found the right teachers for you? Or do you think the general system there in Calgary was, was very healthy? I think it was a very healthy, uh, it was a very wonderful time for classical music in Calgary. I mean, I'm not part of the scene right now, so I can't really say it, but 
back then for sure it was very active uh, with the Kiwanis competition, the Canadian music competitions, the mm -hmm. Royal uh, Conservatory of Music exams, the, um, there was a conservatory that was really, there was an academy, people were going there every week, it was really nice, like we had a formulated, a, a, and Morningside Music Bridge, which is a big program, we had a lot of things that really kept us going through the year mm -hmm. in classical music, and uh, of course the Larry Philharmonic also needs a mention, so, right. so it was, in that sense was a, was a great place to, to grow up, because I had this exposure without having this sort of uh, overhang of greatness, of grandeur, because if, I, I, I imagine, I mean, I didn't have that experience, I didn't grow up in New York, but I imagine if you grew up in, in a big city like New York where you have tons of different artists from London and everybody's sort of around you and you have this greatness, this corner and that corner, then you feel slightly intimidated, there's, there's no way to help it, like you can't not feel intimidated. So. Sure, and I think you, I, again, my memory of you as a young boy was that you described yourself as happy, you were, you seemed in the brief moments that I got an impression very happy, but also you had a wonderful, uh, a healthy and an enjoyable confidence about you, which of course is, is kind of key when you're, you're building a career as a performer, because some people can be amazing pianists technically and have, but if you don't have a certain degree of confidence, it'll be difficult to step out into that world. Um, and, and, yeah, I was a very shy person, uh, and sort of still am, but, but as a kid, I didn't really, I wasn't public, I wasn't outgoing, I wasn't the, the social type necessarily. I would do well with my social context, but it wasn't really important to me, maybe. That's more, more important. And certainly the, the hardest for me was speaking in public, speaking before a performance or speaking in an interview. So to get to know how to do that, to get that confidence, that took simply time. Did that, did that evolve or did you have someone who you, you were able to receive good uh, advice from? My mom, a very good advice from, from my mom, for sure. Right. And support to, to give you that confidence. Um, mm -hmm. And it pushed me through those moments that I really didn't want to and and I know I mean I attended a concert with Josh Bell in Aspen and I was playing a concert the next day or the day after and and what made of course his playing was great no doubt but what made the biggest impression was how he communicated with the audience mm -hmm. with words not only with his playing yes and so basically that was also a, a sort of a key moment for me when I'm playing recitals and of course I have to gauge the situation the hall the language the different barriers that there are and the um, how formal the setting is, but just the confidence of speaking on stage. It, it's not that easy. I mean, it, it looks easy maybe, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, you touch on two points. First, that communication with an audience, which I think is, I think it's always been important. You look back at, uh, you're talking about Chopin and Mendelssohn, that era of Liszt as well, people who, in one way or another, particularly Liszt, were able to jump across the edge of the stage and, and grab people. Uh, but also your mom and, and your parents, it's, dif it's difficult, I think, uh, for people to understand that, well, no, it's probably not difficult for people to understand the, the responsibility that I think a parent feels when they have a talented kid like you and how many mistakes they can make along the way. Um, but they seem to have been always asking the right questions and nurturing your gift in a very productive way. You must be very grateful to them, I guess. I'm extremely grateful. And, and it's amazing because uh, it was definitely not their choice by any stretch of the imagination for me. <laughs> For me to become a musician it all sort of happened and they of course encouraged me and they provided the support when i needed it. and i mean when when you look back at the years when i was learning and the expenses you know lessons tunings uh, competitions it, it was not negligible for them most definitely uh, mm -hmm. so there was that support but there was also that feeling that they would continually ask me if i wanted to do it if, if that was you know are you sure you want to do that it, it was always also setting goals for me because it wasn't that, okay, now you, you have an important concert, so just practice, don't worry about this, don't worry about that. You, you just practice and make sure you're prepared. It was always like, no, 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 no. You do all of the other stuff and then you can go play the concert. So it right. was always that, that sort of, you have to get marks over 90 in school, 90%. Yeah. You have to uh, you know, do the stuff that you need to do at home. You can't just say, no, 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 I have to practice, I have to prepare and the, the rest of the life doesn't discipline matter. translates right into into different areas of life and, and it's something that it's it's kind of independent of those different things you learn discipline as a, as a quality that you have listen um one thing i want to do is i want to plug you're too modest to do this but your recent beethoven release because it's an amazing thing the five concertos on disc in the beethoven year on deutsche gramophone their first release in in the beethoven year it's really a wonderful thing and i think people i think there's there's quite a few videos of you performing them live on YouTube that people can access, but also the discs themselves are fabulous. And that leads me to one final question from our, our viewers, which is from uh, Matteo Nanda in Italy, uh, who asked what your next recording project uh, will be. 
Well, I have one sort of lined up, and I don't know exactly when it'll happen because of the whole situation, mm. but I can't say what it is, unfortunately. But uh, I can't he, he won it. He said it. It'll be so, and it'll be beautiful, and I'm really looking forward to making it, it happen. Um, yeah. it, <laughs> Wonderful. So, um, Jan, would you have be able to give us one more little thing from Mendelssohn? Maybe we've got we got a five minutes, and I need to say thank you to you and everyone else. So, we, maybe three minutes, something like that. Sure. Thank go. you. Oh, that was exquisite. Thank you, Jan, so much. Um, and thank you, thank you for your time, for your playing, for your insights, for your generosity. I, I think our audience has loved it. And they've, there's like, we could do another hour and people would still have questions for you. Um, Great thing you wish we can too. Yeah, I hope so. And, and would you please also send uh, my love to your, your wonderful parents? Um, yeah, I hope we see each other very soon. Um, and for those of you who happen to be in Germany next week, or those of you who are watching from Germany, um, and it's hard to believe I'm saying this, but you can hear Jan in front of a live, physically present audience in Dortmund at the Klavier Festival, uh, Ruhr, where he'll be performing his recital program, I think three or four times. You can check it out on his, uh, his website. Um, I'll be back at the same time in two weeks with another fabulous guest, and I hope that you'll be able to join me then. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to our sponsors, the sponsors that have made Canada Performs such an important and supportive platform for so many Canadian artists. Uh, those are the National Arts Centre, Facebook, Slave Music, Sirius XM, uh, Canada, and the, and the RBC Foundation. Um, please check out the NEC website, nac-cna.ca, uh, where there's really great content from our musicians who are, are putting out daily lunch breaks from their homes, playing and talking and singing. It's really fabulous. Uh, you can also sign up there for our weekly symphony concerts from our archives. Um, if you've enjoyed this, please do uh, like this page, uh, Alexander Shelley Conductor on Facebook. Uh, follow me here or on Instagram, which is Alexander Shelley, under, excuse me, Alexander underscore Shelley, or uh, Twitter, which is at Shelley Conduct, uh, where there's lots more musical offerings and discussions and things you can uh, follow me with. Uh, most importantly, I'd like to thank you for having joined us today. Thank uh, the amazing Jan Shetsky. I hope that you can stay safe, look after yourself uh, and those close to you, and I hope that we can all see each other in person, ideally in a concert hall uh, with some very beautiful music very soon. Thank you for being here and see you soon.